It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcasting a mentor of mine, Keanor Shaw, DMD, MBA, D-I-C-O-I. We both have the same initials. I'm a DDS, MBA, Diplomat, International Congress, Oral and Pontology. Dr. Keanor Shaw is a 36-year-old practicing dentist and an entrepreneur from Palm Springs, California. As a traveling and temporary health care provider, Dr. Shaw has practiced in more than 300 offices. As a businessman, Dr. Shaw has built numerous co-brand, private label, and peer-to-peer partnerships in the healthcare industry. Dr. Shaw is a seasoned educator in clinical topics of head and neck anatomy, biophysics, surgical extractions, and oral implantology. Dr. Shaw addresses domestic and international financial executives annually with healthcare industry forecasts and advises financial technology companies. Dr. Shaw completed his undergraduate studies at Western Illinois University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in the year 2000. Dr. Shaw graduated in 2006 with a doctorate in dental medicine from Southern Illinois University. He has finished an MBA at Brandon University in International Business in 2016. His participation as a fellow of the International Congress of Oral Pontologists, fellow of the California Implant Institute, and fellow of the International Academy of Dental Facial Aesthetics was culminated in his mastership and diplomat status of the International Congress of Oral Pontologists. Dr. Shaw has been in various roles as an inventor, founder, owner, chairperson, CFO, president, managing director, partner, associate, and consultant for a variety of domestic and international related business matters. In addition to his expertise practicing general dentistry, Dr. Shaw practices in the fields of prosthodontics, periodontics, endodontics, pedodontics, orthodontics, and oral surgery. Dr. Shaw reads, writes, and speaks English, German, and Farsi. Says Dr. Shaw, a dentist is a lifetime professional commitment, part artist, part architect, part entrepreneur, part physicist, part surgeon, part businessman, part therapist, and part community friend. Dr. Shaw enjoys world travel, public speaking, studying, researching historical events, and participating in sports, including soccer, table tennis, and fitness. So table tennis is ping pong? That's right. My gosh, we uh, I was lucky. My dad uh, bought us a ping pong table, and then we had this thing we put over it could turn it into a, a ping pong table. So uh, I love that sport. But uh, my gosh, you have more amazing websites, I think, than anybody in dentistry. I mean, there's, there's so many. You have um, Keenor, Keenor Shaw, K-I-A-N-O-R, Shaw, S-H-A-W. KeenorShaw.com, he's got extract exact exta ext academy so extraction academy ext academy.com surgical sedation partners fulcrum implant synergy smile designs.com lendhealth.com uh my gosh uh where where i don't even know where to start with you where, where would you where would you want to start i i want to start with um you know, I've never been a fan of dentists who, um, well, I'm not saying I'm not a fan of dentists for myself personally. Um, I always saw my dental office in my zip code of, uh, in Ahwatukee, which is Phoenix, is that I, I, I have to treat anybody who walks through the door. And so I never target a market to be a cosmetic dentist or an implant dentist or any of those things like that. And a lot of times people go to their dentist and they are in pain and they, they, the, the doctor can't do the extraction. They, they, they say, well, I don't like the blood and gut thing. I just like the soft and pretty bleaching, bonding veneers, CERAC, CAD CAM. Uh, but um, what percent of, what, um, you're talking to a lot of kids right now. Um, it's May 24, so we're going to have another 6,000 kids graduate in a few hours. Um, probably half of them don't like to extract teeth. What advice would you give these young kids coming out who say, well, I I don't like the bloody stuff? Well, first and foremost, the vast majority of patients coming in have a problem of some kind, and sometimes it's uh, pain-related. Extractions being the most common dental procedure around the world, uh, not counting the United States and the biggest healthcare market, is a very important procedure to know. I started with extraction that start, that interested me into implantology and other fields. But with time, as demand comes into the office, these younger students are going to realize how prudent it is to uh, learn and, uh, and, and perform extractions and not to have to refer them out. I had a practice in Southern Illinois where for 60 miles we didn't have an oral surgeon or periodontist. So if you are going to be part of the community, to be able to do simple extractions is very, very important. And I'm not saying that you should do all extractions. You should be very uh, discreet about the case selection process. Uh, But at the same time, your patients need 
this service and uh, it would be great if you can provide it provide and you don't learn it in, in dental school unless you spend a lot of time in the oral surgery department and clock in and clock out you really need some uh, uh, training and um, continuing education classes from your colleagues that have been doing it for a long time so so what would my homies find at extacademy.com well we would start with uh, an online uh, portion where we uh, train and teach in the most basic concept from anatomy to biophysics to what we generally do in, uh, in anesthesia settings so the dentists are aware if they ever bring an anesthesiologist to their office to alleviate pain for their patients. Um, uh, then we move into workshops where we do an extraction workshop where we see a greater amount of uh, participants, where we work on pig jaws, general concepts. I get a doctor from New York University who works in the oral surgery department. He comes out for these workshops and brings, out, brings us the latest updates and what is acceptable in coronectomies and other procedures and what the opinion uh, leaders are saying. So we, we essentially are a conduit for uh, the information out there about nutrient extraction techniques and how we can do things better. And things have changed from your time a little bit when you started uh, with, with hand pieces advancing and, um, and other techniques coming about. We think differently about extractions now that we do 30 years ago. We look at it as the foundation of the next step in the prosthetic treatment, be it um, uh, um, uh, an implant or any other prosthesis. You want to maintain bone. And when you do extractions now, you want to think about what and where you're going to end up. Because if you don't and you don't do things such as socket grafting or you don't attend to those type of things, the patient uh, ends up having to do extensive uh, additional ancillary procedures down the road in order to be able to get that implant. So it's very, very, very important that if you don't even want to perform extractions, which is your right as a dentist to choose the areas that you want to practice in, that you know the general concepts so you can refer properly and you can also have a long-term plan for your patient. You know, I'm so old when we start when I start extractions, we just tie a rope around the tooth to a big <laughs> boulder and walk into a cliff and throw it over. Um, so where are these courses at? Are they all in Palm Springs where you practice? No, we uh, do them. We've done some close to the CDA. We do some in San Diego. We are now expanding to other areas. We have 12 faculty members that have recently joined um, that uh, do believe that it's important to teach more extractions. Uh, being an implantologist, and so you, so, you, so are you, you're very familiar, um, everybody that I run into is trying to teach how to place implants better. But we already know that 98% plus of the time, if you do proper implant placement, you get initial stability, you're going to get integration. But we're not teaching extractions. Uh, and then we're not teaching extractions because that's, in my opinion, probably 80% of the work if you are going to be doing an immediate implant uh, and uh, maintaining your buckle bone and knowing all the tips and tricks uh, on recovering root tips, they're going to become very handy for you. So we want to show that in, on pig jaws and tougher uh, um, tissue type scenarios where we can suture and train uh, the doctors, especially the younger generations. On uh, And then so, some of them continue to module three where we teach immediate implants and module four where we do live surgical courses. But uh, I think the module two is very prudent for uh, all of my colleagues. Um, so how many modules do you have? Four modules. Four modules, one, two, three, and four. Um, Tell me what uh, are all for these modules? Are these on Kianorshaw.com, EXT Academy, or Surgical Sedation Partners? For, which website explains all EXT, four? EXT Academy is specifically focused on uh, advanced extraction techniques and uh, immediate implantology. Okay. Well, is that one of those modules one, two, three, or four? That's that uh, has the entire mini residency, which is composed of module one, which is the online portion, module two, the extraction workshop, module three, the immediate implant workshop, and module four, uh, being the life surgical training with us, where we do shoulder shoulder training with the doctors, and then they uh, essentially graduate from this mini resident residency, and uh, we route them towards our colleagues in the implant uh, industry to get training if they're interested in that. After that, and how much uh, does each module cost, or is it a package deal for all four? What, what's the? This is dentistry and sensor. They want to know the brutal details. How much <laughs> does this cost? I believe the online series with twelve continuing education credits, nine hundred dollars. The module one workshop, which is an eight-hour course um, in various uh, hotel or conference settings, that's one thousand dollars. The immediate implant workshop is. 
fifteen hundred dollars, and uh, live surgical is thirty eight hundred dollars. That's a two day course, sixteen credit hours combined. Uh, you get some thirty and, some. And you kids, when, when you when you see these prices, and you'll say something like, I, I, I see people sit there and say, "Well, I don't want to learn orthodontics." Brock Rendo, his his whole series, or, or um, Richard Litt. A lot of people. Oh, sure. Say, well, I want to learn ortho, but. Richard Litt's continuum is like five grand, and and Brock Rondos is five grand. I'm like, dude, one ortho case is five grand. I mean, you go you go pay a thousand dollars to an extraction course and come home and remove one set of wisdom teeth. You just got your money back instantly. Um, I, I want to go back to some of the uh, things. Uh, I just want to say one thing that I've picked up big time over 30 years and all my oral surgeon friends agree with me. I've never had an oral surgeon friend disagree with me, but when they look at complications from like removing a wisdom teeth um m- a lot of them start with you snapped off this little two three four millimeter root tip and you go digging after it and then you you do some damage and they just said my god you just have to have the, be humble and have an ego big enough to leave a little root tip in there don't go in there i mean that you already pulled out 95 percent of the tooth you probably put the wisdom tooth is probably pericornitis it might have been decay but they say the only problem they have with root tips is a year later when it's being exfoliated through the gum tissue like a splinter and you take it out with tweezers. Do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? So if you have this debate all the time at the Extraction Academy, it depends on your philosophy. My philosophy is if I, if I am uh, getting ready to infringe up on an anatomical landmark, be it a nerve or an artery or a vein that I know is there or – if I'm close to a sub uh, uh, mental uh, fossa or a sublingual fossa, you have to consider your situation. Sometimes it's wiser to just leave the two millimeter or three millimeter of fruit, so you don't cause more permanent, you don't cause more damage or permanent damage at that. And uh, uh, who cares if you have to exfoliate it in a year or six months? Uh, Coronectomies, thats what it's all about is that you take the crown off, prevent the uh, root from pushing or causing cavity underneath the second molar, and then uh, come back. And if the body rejects it, there's two things that can happen. Either the body's going to deposit bone over it, and you'll never know it's there, um, or uh, it's going to eject it, or it's going to make it looser on the periodontal ligament. So next time you come around, you can lift it out a lot easier. But then you can you have to watch the patient, because if you leave too much root, now the body can say, hey, this is a foreign object. I'm going to start an infection here. Then you got to go in there and maybe it's a good time to refer to an oral surgeon and say, hey, I'm not comfortable with draining this thing and popping this this, this root tip out. Will you please do that for me? So there's a lot at play. Uh, I have Dr. Dr. Greenwood, for example, in our academy. He doesn't leave anything. He he goes after it. He's like, what? Leave a root tip. I'm the surgeon. I'm going to get it out. So they go in and get it out. Uh, So it depends on your philosophy. And actually, this uh, at this course uh, next on the 9th in San Diego, at the San Diego Dental Convention, we're going to be focusing specifically on this debate uh, of uh, is it wiser to leave even more than f- four or five millimeters of roots, especially in the wisdom tooth area, uh, versus trying to uh, take it out. And if you have a, a premolar root or, or, or a functional tooth that you need to restore with an implant, then you obviously got to get the root tip out. And then you have to look at, am I close to sinus? Am I close to the mental nerve? Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, different variables that a, that a clinician will have to decide on when they are in the surgical field. You know, um, I don't know what I have more of, uh, root tips left in or skeletons in the closet. That would be, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Um, I think it's very profound that you have your extraction course, module two, and then implants number three, because... I've always been amazed at how many of my friends um, have um, the skill set to extract a tooth, but then they cringe and say, well, I, I don't think I could place implants. It's like, do you th- what, what do you think needs more skill, to remove a tooth or to replace it with an implant? Are those equal skills or is one greater than the other? No. Implants are a lot easier. They're a lot less painful also for the patients. Uh, I always compare it to having a filling or a crown uh, because – you know, you 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 have uh, bone, for lack of better term, much similar to a solid structure like wood. You're you're going in. It's it's guided. It's very easy. The hardest part is the extraction. If you mess up on the extraction, you can have aesthetic problems. You can have all kinds all sorts of problems. The vast majority of the work is done after the extraction. If you like extractions, you will like implants. You just need to take a couple of courses uh, and get all the tips and tricks. And if you know your anatomy, you're good to go. Uh, extractions are the hardest part by far. 
Um, you know, you have uh, module one is um, an online series for you. You have 12 online courses, uh, right, for 900 bucks, right? Correct. You know what I think would be the best marketing for you to do? Is put the first course on Dentaltown. Uh, I'd love to. We've put up, um, uh, I think, 411 courses, and they're coming up on a million views. And a lot of people um, who say they have a three-day course um, for, like, three to six grand or whatever. And it's, it's a big jump to go for them. I'm seeing this ad in a dental magazine to pay in three to four grand and flying across the country. So to disintermediate the sales, putting an hour online CE course and say this is the greatest hits – uh, I, I would do a greatest hits uh, online CE course for each module because um, then they'll fall in love. With, they'll meet their instructors. They'll they'll fall in love with you. They'll still get the information, and it, it's kind of like it's kind of like when they do those reverse annuity uh, commercials. I mean, you can't get grandma to sell you her house and take an annuity in a sixty second commercial. So they <laughs> disintermediate it, and the whole commercial is just to try to get them to get the CD ROM. And then the whole CD-ROM is just focused on, well, just make the phone call so they can tell you how much your house is worth and what your monthly annuity would be. But uh, I, I think the best marketing would be to do a one-hour course on each one of your four um, curriculums. Um, you used to do webinars, and I would love to talk to you about that a little bit because, like you said – uh, for younger kids coming out of school now with three, four, five hundred thousand in debt, it's really a tough one to swallow. When I got out from Illinois, it was a hundred and hundred and ten, hundred and twenty, some eleven years ago. Now these guys are coming out; they're buried with debt. They're being hammered with uh, with bills, and they want to start their life. They want to get married. They want to buy a house. They're not. They're, it's not on top of their mind to spend five, six grand on ortho course. But nine hundred dollars is very reasonable. And when they can do it from the convenience of their home and get all of the insight, at least, uh, then they can decide if they want to go to another uh, 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 symposium or a course or uh, participate in one of the workshops. But uh, to be able to, to, to collect 12 credit units from the convenience of your home or wherever you are for a reasonable price, which is going to give you a lot of insight into the most common procedure in dentistry, I think it's a, it's a valuable proposition. Well, you know, they say think outside the box. I'm going to say this to you, and you're going to think I'm crazy, but it's true. If you look at Americans worth $100 million or more, most of the people think, oh, it's some 65-year-old man that owns a big factory. No, it's always an 80-year-old female widow, <laughs> and they're all living out where you are at Palm Springs. So they should go to this course, and you should have a dating site with 80-year-old, 100-million-year-old women dating these young, hot little students walking out. And if they marry right, who cares that they're $500,000 in debt? She's got a hundred right. million dollars and she's 80. You need to marry that woman. Hey, um, there's a big controversial threat on Dentaltown um, about bone grafting a post-extraction site. The, the naysayers say, okay, dude, you're just doing that because you're billing the patient extra three or 400. Then other people say, no, this is necessary. And then it gets into all these details. Well, well, is it necessary only if the patient is going to have an implant later? Um, what if they don't get the implant for two or three or four years, does the did the bone graft even matter? Uh, where where do you weigh in on bone grafting an extraction site? I have a philosophy that goes both ways, as you mentioned. Back in dental school, the oral surgeon that I attribute a lot of things that I've learned from was a was keen on allowing the, the extraction socket to heal from bottom up. And his contention was that if something gets enlarged in there, the body will push it out, and these bone graft materials are not going to be uh, 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 staying there. Then there's the contention that, hey, all of these bone graft materials are not going to be part of our own body. They get resorbed. They're only there to attract um, uh, osteoclasts and osteoblasts and uh, whatever uh, cytokines we need to uh, um, and growth factors that we need to make the, the bone. So it's going to turn over into your own bone. So where would I recommend bone grafting? If you're planning to do an implant in a site and you're taking a tooth out, uh, it's justified for you to do bone grafting there. You keep the volume, the thickness, the height, uh, and as you know, vertical bone grafting is extremely tough. But if you're in a maxillary wisdom tooth and you, you put bone up there, it's just, you know, it's a little bit unethical because 
you're not going to do an implant up there. You know it's going to heal. You don't barely sometimes need to even suture it. Um, on the lower, lowers, okay, now you have a reason. You're going to put the bone in there. There's less chance of dry socket. You know that uh, food is a lot harder to go up versus down, so they lodge in the lower wisdoms. Sometimes I they break out the, the, the bone graft, and, and then I put some bone on the lower wisdom teeth, and I get no phone calls afterwards, and the patient is happy, comfortable. But in essence, both of these uh, both of these forces have a great point. Um, if you if you go in and every time you take a tooth out, you put bone in there with the wrong intention, then you are overcharging the patient because the patient might need, not need it. But if you know you're going to do an implant there and you know you're going to come back or you know that the sinus is dropping everywhere else and you would help the patient if you put a little bit of bone up there to keep it up there, then it's justified. So there is a yes and no answer to both scenarios. Again, it comes down to the clinician's expertise and the clinician's intent. And uh, uh, and uh, that's what's most important. What is your intent? Okay. Well, you just you just said um, that it's very different for maxillary versus mandibular. You, you saying that? Um, go over that again. That might have flown over a lot of people's heads. So so yeah. So if you're gonna take a maxillary tooth out and you don't have a sinus exposure, you put the mirror in there and you you hold the patient's nose and you have them breathe a little bit and you don't see any kind of uh, fogging on your mirror or uh, any kind of spraying of uh, little droplets of blood, then you know you don't have a sinus exposure. Food is not going to go up there. So, you know, if you do your um, standard post-operative regimen of telling the patient, hey, you know, you're not supposed to suck through anything and spit, and and so you don't lose that blood clot, you're not going to have problems on the uppers. But sometimes in the lowers, if you have a very apprehensive patient uh, that uh, you go in and you start cutting and you have to section the tooth in three, four pieces and you got a big, big hole there, and you got to get primary closure, and you wanna, you can't pull your tissue around. It's not a bad idea to put some bone down in a membrane and close it up and get your primary closure. And you're gonna be rest assured you're gonna have much less of a possibility for a dry socket in that scenario. Not that I do that on every case, but in indications where I have removed bone and I know this patient is gonna be undergoing some pain, especially during the first 72 hours. Uh, I, I, I propose it and then I do it. But routinely, I don't recommend uh, uh, every patient get a bone graft in every site for no reason. There has to be an intention and there has to be a reason of why you're doing what you're doing. And you have to document it so you can justify why you did it. And there's all kinds of grafts. Um, when you do a bone graft, what, what are you using? I use demineralized uh, autogenous bone graft and I explain to the patient, they always wonder where it comes from. In California, you, know, you have a law where you have to really explain to the patients where you got it and what it is that you're putting into the body. So once I explain to them that it's demineralized and it's been cleaned and it's been part of a bank, they always have the same concerns about uh, STD, I mean, uh, any kind of diseases that might be transferred to this, uh, to this uh, grafting. And once you settle them and you explain to them that this is happening in just about all the surgical practices across America, um, they start uh, being a little bit more apt to accept your proposal of putting autogenous bone graft in. But there is also xenografts and bovine and this and that. Uh, like you said, the list is extremely long. But I've had the best with... And then, uh, you know, once you get more involved and you get into my, into uh, some of our other uh, ventures that we're on, we'll, we'll teach you how to do PRP, PRF, which Dr. Hakamian is big on, um, someone that you actually recently post- podcasted. He works with us on the, in the academy on that. And we'll teach you other methods where you can um, um, accelerate healing for the patient, if that's indicated. And where are you buying your demineralized bone grafts? Uh, um, the office manager is get, I have to get you back to you on that. From our supplier, I think uh, Pearson is supplying us. Huh? It's it's so expensive though, isn't it? 120, 130 bucks a pie, uh, maybe one cc, two ccs. I mean, so what, why does that stuff cost more than my heroin and cocaine? I never <laughs> figure that out. This is certainly uncensored, huh? How, how <laughs> they do my really bone well. Crafting material costs more than my oxycontin and heroin and cocaine and whatever else they're selling on the streets today. So let's go to your next website, surgicalsedationpartners.com. What do my homies find at surgicalsedationpartners.com? This is actually a recent project we launched with Dr. Jahromi from um, Loma Linda. She recently uh, 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 worked with me in another practice and things developed uh, and we, we started thinking, you know, everywhere we go, because she's a traveling anesthesiologist, a dentist and anesthesiologist and I'm a traveling um, dental 
surgeon. I'm still a GP. But uh, what we've noticed in all of these practices that I've gone in and out of and talking to my colleagues, hundreds of them, and, and, and understanding what their needs and, uh, and desires are, patients that come in and that are apprehensive right in the waiting room. For example, I had an Italian patient uh, two days ago that uh, would not uh, uh, would jump out of the chair, would cry, just haven't even picked up the needle, and she would get worried about her throat being numb. So you have a tremendous amount of patients that have dental anxiety. How do we solve that? Yes, I've seen some of the videos uh, of some things you have done uh, um, uh, in training and teaching treatment presentation and working with the apprehensive patient. But all of those things don't always cut it for the most extreme side. So anxiolysis, <clears throat> conscious sedation, deep sedation, uh, general anesthesia, if we can offer that service in these practices to all of my colleagues in Southern California and later uh, nationwide, uh, it's a phone call away for the office to pick it up and say, hey guys, we need help with this patient, can you come down? So we come down, we put the patient at ease, they sleep and dream all of their anxieties away. We get to in a quiet sense. I do a lot of full mod rehabs, a lot of all on eights, all on fours, full mod extractions. And it's really convenient when the patient is is, is not gagging and is not um, uh, 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 regurgitating. And you, you can do your work uh, in a clean environment and knock it out in a speedy and the patient is comfortable and they wake up with this which is my biggest my biggest uh, thing in dentistry. What, what I love is when they wake up with this newfound confidence. It's amazing. So uh, we thought that it would be a, a, a good idea to provide this service like a double pack to every practice in Southern California. And when they call us, we bring our own carts. We go in. They have a room for us. We set up 15 minutes. We have already done all of our homework on the patient's medical history and uh, have given them all the instructions and the consents, and uh, we get to work. And uh, the patients are happy, and they spread the word, and it's a good situation. So I think it's uh, it's very important to offer this type of service to all patients. As you know, uh, not all, I mean, not everybody likes us. We're doing something really good for society, and, uh, and if, if they liked us, there would be a big uh, line out the door. But people are afraid of us. I mean, they're afraid of root canals. They're afraid of extractions. They're afraid of all of it. Um, and some of them aren't. I don't, I don't think they are afraid of dentists. I, I think they're afraid of the dental assistant. <laughs> okay, they're afraid of the needle yeah, if you want no, to get down to the... It's that scary <laughs> dental assistant. It's not the dentist. We're, we're the nice guy. Um, you know, um, I, I have a lot... You know, when you lecture around the world, and man, if anybody's lecturing around the world, it's been you. Hell, you've lived in, what, three countries? Um, you know... Other countries um, do not allow the surgeon to do the anesthesia. They say no. And in American hospitals, um, the cardiovascular surgeon can't do the anesthesia in any hospital in America. They say, no, these are two separate skills. We want one person completely focused on the anesthetic. And it's only in this cottage industry dentistry we're, we're oral surgeons and periodontists and general dentists are running IVs and doing the surgery. And I, I've never done I, I I think it's a really bad idea. And the other really? reason I think it's bad is because when someone loses a patient, I mean, think of the tragedy that. Think of going home after work. Most nights you're tired and just want a beer and watch ESPN. But imagine going home and someone else went to the morgue. I mean, and I've seen uh, – I know another uh, – I, well, I, I just – I, I just think it's a really bad idea. Do you agree with that or disagree? I absolutely agree with you. I have never touched a patient without an anesthesiologist in the room. And we don't do two patients at the same time ever. We have never had a, a head of fatality. I have had colleagues that have had tail of fatalities. I've been in this business for 11 years working with countless anesthesiologists. I hate to tell you, uh, uh, um, there's also been incidents with children and it's devastating for a clinician. I think it would break me if I had uh, such an incident. But at the same time, there is a demand for it. And if you do it safely, you do it with professionals. You know, these are graduates from Loma Linda and anesthesiologists that have been doing this for a long time that I work with. And if you do it in a safe environment, you do all your homework with everything else, you will come out safe. That's just it. But you should never do it yourself, never. That's a horrible idea. Uh, uh, as a dentist, don't do it yourself. Have someone there. 
You want to spread the liabilities and you also want to spread uh, uh, and you want to also be prepared for the patient. So I'm not saying any dentist should do it. I have 11 years experience. She has 10 years of experience. We've been doing it quite a while. We just picked up another anesthesiologist that is at 20 years because the demand is going up. There will be more surgeons and specialists that are going to join us. But don't do it yourself. Reach out to people with like anything else. Reach out to people that are experts in this. And, and I'll you tell you what, find- when you uh, go to your little course and you think you're all that in a bag of chips, when they get you on the witness stand and they bring in a board-certified anesthesiologist to start cross-examining you, the jury finds out in about 11 seconds that you don't know your ass from second base. <laughs> you're done. And then there's a dead person. And it's it'd be one thing if the dead guy was an 80-year-old man with a liver spot, but oh my God, imagine killing a child. I mean, it's just it's just crazy. And I also predict this, you know, the lawyers, everybody hates lawyers until they get a good one to defend them. And um, I'll tell you what, the lawyers are the checks and balance. And I predict that in 10, 20, 30 years, there'll be some landmark case where they ban anybody, any doctor in America doing the surgery and the anesthesia, because that was the issue in the United Kingdom, what, five years ago? What, do you remember when it popped up in the United Kingdom? Yeah. The, uh, the, the, um, the NHS started looking at the number of deaths per million um, by anesthesiologists versus the only people doing the anesthesia and the surgery, which was oral surgeons. And I, don't quote me on this, but I think, I think they had a three to one uh, mortality rate over the anesthesiologist. I mean, there's still both incredibly rare events, but I wouldn't want to be put down with a three times greater chance than a one. one I'd rather, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I don't want a three times greater chance. Um, by the way, tell um, Dr. Jerome, uh, what, her name's Marjan B. Jerome, if she wants to come on a podcast. In fact, if she wants to uh, do it, if she can do it quick, we could uh, release hers after yours if she's interested in that. But, yeah, I just. Uh, she's an amazing doctor. She, was in, uh, she went to Michigan, you know, as one of the, be- one of the better schools. Uh, then she did Loma Linda residency. Now she's a director at the Children's uh, uh, Anesthesiology Unit in L.A., and she's a director at Loma Linda. So she's a, I mean, she impresses me of what she has done. And I trust her because the Dental Board of California gets her get their, gets their advice from her. They consult her uh, about anesthesia cases. So uh, it's very prudent. I agree with you 100%. Don't do it yourself. No matter what course you took, no matter how good you think you are, get somebody that's an expert or it's going to be your butt, like you said, uh, when you stand on that stand. So is Loma Linda, do they still have the, that, that's in Redlands, right? Yeah, six, they graduate six of these guys a year that are doing anesthesia, a dentist anesthesiologist. And even if you're an anesthesiologist from the medical profession in California, you still have to register with a dental board uh, uh, or you're operating uh, against uh, the act. So uh, um, uh, things are very, very regulated. Your malpractice is heavily involved. Um, yeah, so you have to, be very careful with sedation. And yes, if you kill a child, you are going to be national news. I remember a couple of years that happened in Illinois uh, for a little child that had anesthesia and never woke up and the dentist was doing it, and it's a disaster. You know, it, it's, it's every year. I mean, last year was one in Hawaii. Um, there, there's one article going around. Uh, I mean, there's been several in just Texas. I mean, it, it's every year. You can't, if you're on, if you're on Facebook, you can't go a year without seeing one of these cases and they're, yeah. they're just, uh, they're just devastating. Um, crazy. crazy I think, crazy. I think you're going to have a great podcast with Dr. Jaromi and maybe even Dr. Wiedemann who, uh, is now sort of, um, up there in the oral surgery department at New York university about why it is important and what we are doing in the extraction field. I'll, uh, definitely, uh, contact them, contact our colleagues. And I, I, I'm uh, fairly sure they're going to want to get this with you done uh, rapidly. Does, does Loma Linda still have the dental assistance mafia going strong? <laughs> so when I got I have... 87, I, to take boards, if I took boards in Kansas City, it was only for the Midwest. But I wanted to practice in Phoenix, so I had to take Western regional boards. And at that time, it was in Loma Linda. And I, I called down there and I started Loma Linda, and they were telling me, true, this is a true story, you can't make this shit up. They go, well, you know, the dental assistants, uh, they're, they're the mafia that run this, uh, this uh, board program. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, if you bring your own dental assistant, like 40% of the people fail their boards. 
But if you hire one of their dental assistants, you will always pass the boards. So I'm like, <laughs> damn, okay. So I'm taking my boards at Loma Linda, and here I am, this 24-year-old punk-ass kid doesn't know anything. And I have, like, this 50-year-old lady, and she keeps, uh, uh, you know, looking at my prep, and she's going, no, you need more of this. You need more of that. So she basically coached me through every procedure. And then the line to check the boards, all these strange dental assistants that were brought in, you know, they're all in line, but all the mafiosa Loma Linda dental assistants, they just walk straight in the front of the line, walk in the deal. So that's my, you went tip. from Kansas, right? Did you take your board? You went to Kansas and then you took your boards here or yeah, in Arizona? I, was in Wichita. I went to dental school in Kansas city, but um, I decided to practice in Phoenix. So I just wanted my Western regional boards. And at the time um, it was only in Loma Linda. Would you agree that the Midwest uh, uh, is a lot more warmth? There's a lot more warmth in the Midwest than uh, out here. And this dentistry is quite a bit different out in the Midwest. Because when I moved from Illinois, from Chicago to, to uh, Orange County, I was just unbelievable. These dentists don't want to hire. So it's very populated from about Santa Monica down to, uh, down to uh, San Diego. And I didn't have all these credentials. So there's these five, six dental officers pouring these dental students out. These poor guys don't have jobs. They run to Nevada. They run to Texas. They run to Phoenix with all this debt. And then it's the most populated little strip in the country with dentists, some of the best. You know, you got the Dorfmans and these guys and those guys. So you're competing and trying to get a job is almost uh, literally impossible unless you, you go out and, and get uh, get additional uh, credentials so you're compatible. Cause, uh, so, so to tell you that uh, when I went from my offices, the six offices I had in Illinois to – Selling those and moving to California, my life, I just, I was mind boggled. These doctors, they set up these shops. They don't have hygienists. They don't see the value in hygienists. They do their own cleanings. They're fighting. Every corner has a dental office. It's a big zoo out here. I'm sure you know. Uh, but what is your take on the Midwest dentistry versus the West Coast dentistry? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of the term United States of America because it doesn't make any sense. I mean, no one calls Europe the EU because no one compares Germany to Greece. No one compares, you know, Italy to Denmark. And the United States is really, a, even the central bankers call it nine different countries under one flag. And, you know, I, I tell, if, if you're graduating uh, next week from dental school, uh, two-thirds of the dentists go to 147 metros that have half the United States population. And only one third of the dentists go to the rural, which has 19,000 towns and as much as 11% don't have a dentist. And everybody that goes, any, anybody that walks out of dental school doesn't take Medicaid, Medicare, no PPOs, signs up fee for service, does $1 million the first year and takes 350,000 home. They all were about a two hour drive away from an airport to go fly to Palm Springs or L.A. And, and when I look at the demographics from San Diego all the way up to L.A., Monterey, San Fran, within a mile of the ocean, you got about a dentist for every 350 people. And there are so many towns in America. Hell, Iowa. I mean, I, Iowa has a list of towns that if you go there, the governor will give you a check for $100,000. Delta Dental will match it with $100,000. Then you go to downtown, there's six boarded up bankrupt buildings that the, the mayor will give you. So now you have 200,000 in cash, you have land building, no mortgage. And then in those towns, a great job is $10 an hour. So you hire the cream of the crop. You don't have to lower your fee with the PP. I mean, I mean, think of this bottle of water. Say, say you make it for 90 cents and sell it for a dollar. What does the PPO do? Oh, well, sign up for our plan, and you can sell it for 90 cents. Well, now, now you're just busy. You're just making yeah. noise. But in a small town, you'll say, well, I make it for 90 cents, and I'm not going to sell it for a dollar. I'm going to sell it for $1.30. So that they, they will make four times. I mean, it's just you got to go rural. And, it, and these people who say demographics don't matter, imagine going back to uh, Europe. Don't you can you become a millionaire you? as a dentist in small-town America. I'll tell you that right now. Every the best time. office I've ran was in small town, Midwest America. That's the most income I had, the most success I had, the most ball buster offices that I ran were in small town America. And, you know, a lot of people don't study the, the lesson of the genius Rick Workman, who owns more dental offices than anybody in the world. He owns like 1,500 offices. He started in Effingham, and he was so smart. He went to the insurance companies. And say, where are you selling dental insurance, getting complaints that there's no dentist? 
And I think it was Connecticut General, or I think it was Connecticut General who said, you're in Illinois, here's 10 towns that don't even have a dentist. We get complaints from all the time, and here's how many people have insurance. And then he, and then he, uh, and then it got, even got to the point, he says, well, I can't open up all 10 because I don't have the money. And they're like, dude, we'll co-sign the loan. And, and Walmart, Walmart was in 32 states before it landed in its first major urban city like Dallas or Kansas City or whatever. They were just crawling through the back hills of America where there were no Sears, there were no uh, J.C. Penney's, nobody, nobody cared about Bentonville, Arkansas. You know, there's 5,000 people there, and the S&P 500 doesn't even think they exist. And, it's funny you mentioned that. I, I worked with, both with Rick and Walmart. I actually spent some time with Rick in Effingham, and I also had uh, had an idea about building some offices in Walmart. But you're right. The model that they're doing came to uh, the rural areas. That's how they became so big that they have 6,500-plus uh, locations now, Walmart does. But corporate dentistry is growing at the same pace, so or maybe faster even. So let's go to your next uh, website, fulcrumimplant.com. What is fulcrumimplant.com? That's the big project of my life, my friend. It's an implant that I've designed for the past year and a half that I patented. Uh, well, uh, um, that is about a new design and implant and a new way of uh, delivering that implant. And uh, it came about uh, from walking one day. I walk eight, nine miles when I ever get a chance as a means to clear my head. And I was looking at all these structures, uh, skyscrapers, uh, buildings, um, signs. They're all sort of positioned into the ground, into solid structure. And they're not round like we are doing. Conical implants came around uh, the early ages with the Mishas and the Nisniks and those guys. And they just designed several different uh, conical implants. And... Um, and I don't think conical implants are the right way to go. Uh, in my opinion, thinking outside of the box, um, I thought about initial stability by a one-unit implant that's polygonal in cross dimension, and that wedges into the bone from uh, from multiple different angles. Not only from the fulcrum part, the bottom part that's sharp, that's shaped like a chisel, that self-adjusts an occlusion when the patients would bite in theory but also it would uh, eliminate the need for drilling, um, causing osteonecrosis. Uh, and since it's a diamond shape and cross dimension, um, it has a less buccal width, a buccal lingual width. And what it does is uh, during the driving, it has osteointegration holes and it allows for autogenous bone grafting as you drive the implant in. You get probably three to four times the initial stability than any other implant. We have tested it um, in various settings, swine, human jaws, and uh, industrial-grade pliers will remove them. So when we get to the stage when we do in, vi in vivo studies on humans, um, I might have something here that countless oral surgeons and uh, periodontists have looked at and thought it's pretty uh, smart, where you can load the same day, you don't have to make the patient wait six months. You are going to be able to very easily place it, um, uh, not only in extraction sites, but eventual spaces. You're going to get your profound um, uh, strength from a one solid unit implant with no holes, no screws, no parts, no cement. And you'll be able to drive it and you'll be able to restore it, temporize it, and then later restore it. And you're going to have your a strong substructure and you're going to have your strong um, prosthetic that goes on top of it which could be a ceramic so you get the best of both worlds um, there's a lot going with this research we're getting ready to publish a journal article in a few day in a few weeks with some impactful journals pertaining the in vivo in vitro studies that we have done and uh, I will be uh, glad to share that with you. So far, it's going really good. We are about a year and a half into it. And we did some FEM, FEM tests, uh, fatigue and strength. And it came back as uh, perhaps arguably the strongest implant in the world. So that's, um, tell me if you agree or disagree with this. I, I get a lot of, uh, I see a lot of posts on Dentaltown. I get a lot of emails at Howard at Dentaltown.com where they say, in America, um, the implant you use is so bundled with the continued education, they feel like they almost have to pick which implant they're going to place before they go get educated because it's kind of all wrapped up into one. So I know I, my, my job is to get my, – my job is to, on this show is to get great guests on like you 
and then try to guesstimate what questions they're asking. And I'm based on my questions on what they email me, what I see on Dentaltown. But I know they're all driving to work right now thinking, Howard, ask them, what implant do you use? And if I did uh, your um, your academy and I went there and the immediate um, of the implant uh, continue number three, um, should I already have a system? Do you recommend a system? What what Talk about because because the the last there were 170 implant companies that had a booth at the last IDS meeting in Cologne, Germany, and if you Google implant companies, the list is now 400 people selling implants. How is a 25 year old woman who just walked out of dental school supposed to make sense of 400 different implant systems? I think it's ridiculous. I think it's absurd. I think it needs to be stopped at some point. Um, none of these, uh, uh, number A, I don't recommend any Dell, uh, Dell implant company. I currently use Sweden Martina, but I've worked with uh, uh, countless, probably over 20, 20 different uh, systems because when I go into a temporary setting, whatever system they have, I use because I can become familiar with it in a matter what of 10 you minutes. What did you use Sweden Martini? Sweden Martina, they're a European company out of Italy. I've been using them for uh, general implants, and I've used Dentis, I've used MIS, uh, BioHorizon. You go down the list, I've used them all. But I don't promote any particular implant system at the courses. If an implant company decides they want to get a table in the back, that's fine. We, 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 we honor that from time to time. But bottom line is 250 or more FDA-approved implant system vast majority of them are non-compatible with each other, which creates a, a, a scenario of scarcity and forcing these dentists to come back to the company, even if they're dissatisfied with their service. There's no uh, the biggest problem being universal compatibility. I don't know, in my implant practice, I don't know how many patients come in. Uh, Dr. XYZ placed this implant 20, 30 years ago. Nobody can find out on the x-rays what implant system it is, the best of the best. We can't get the parts. It becomes a big, big headache. What we need, and implantology is compatibility, uniqueness, uh, uh, simplicity, because um, more GPs should be doing this. Uh, it's becoming a gold rush. If you listen to some of Dr. Ziv Simon as lectures, there's a gold rush now in implantology. If you get on that boat, you're gonna be you're gonna be setting yourself up for great success in your private and your clinical. And you're gonna help a lot of people because, as you know, it's one of the most common diseases: missing teeth. And implants are readily becoming center of care versus bridges. You know, you, you want to keep making the money and you do the bridges and then somebody sues you and you should have done an implant. It's a bad scenario. Uh, shaving down uh, virgin teeth and so forth. But I do not agree with the way the, the implantology world is going. These companies have way too much influence and uh, uh, they set up these global academies and it's all part of their spiel. And you think you're getting clean education while you're getting influence to buy into their system. Those things... We are smarter than that as doctors. We see through that right away. And we should continue seeing through that and only seek out the continuing education that tells us how to do the procedure, not what system works best. We all know it's going to work. 98% of them take. They all take. If they pass the FDA regulations, they're going to take. So, uh, yes, hopefully we can cut those down with uh, an implant that comes out that is universally compatible everywhere you go. So um, let's go on to your next one, LendHealth.com. A financial technology. What's all that about? I frequently speak at uh, big uh, financial events. It's called financial technology. It's a boom that has happened in the last maybe five to ten years where these companies have come out and they cut out the banks and uh, they cut out the third parties and do direct peer-to-peer -peer lending. I'm big on peer-to-peer. -peer. If you're a dentist and you tell me something, I'm going to listen to it. If you're an outsider and you come into my profession and you're trying to tell me something, I'm going to be very careful and I'm going to be listening very carefully to what you have to say. So peer-to-peer -peer is a huge idea. Uh, now they're getting their own charter with the Office of the Contemporary of Currency. Uh, it's getting big to a point where the banks are getting nervous because billions and billions are now flowing through these bank accounts of these entities that come out, set up a financial technology and enable a borrower and a, and a lender to connect directly without all the fees and all the games and all of the monies they take off the top to marginalize you. So it becomes a scenario where senior colleagues can help their, their junior colleagues invest in a profession they understand versus these mutual funds and all these other things that are pushed in front of them by these financial advisors. So peer-to-peer -peer, uh, and financial technology is a phenomenal 
innovation of our time. It started with things like bitcoins, and then it went into patient financing, and then it went to real estate, and then it went to auto business. So I go and I sit in front of executives of banks, executives of financial technology companies, uh, um, uh, politicians, and all of the major people that come to these, these very unique events, and I speak about healthcare. And I'm sort of establishing myself as the person that does the annual healthcare forecast for these people, be it in China, Europe, and the United States. So a couple of times a year I get out and I lecture on other things. They need to know, all these other forces need to know that although we don't get enough business education and training in dental school, there's some of us that have a business acumen. And we want to take that business acumen and we want to pass it on to our colleagues so they don't get taken advantage of by the same people. So I go to these events and I lecture. And I'm the only doctor or dentist in those events. And uh, and it's very well received. I do my research with the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. I do my research about new innovations and technologies. And I consult some of these companies and their healthcare divisions in order to do it better. So they're not coercing the dentist to make more money, but emphasize more on case presentation and treatment plan presentation and educating the patient. And the patients will, at their own discretion, sign up for these financing plans and the doctors will benefit without having to give up 10, 5% off the top. So we're we're working on the infrastructure. There's a lot of regulations involved. There's also not only the regulation from the financial sectors, but also the regulation with us uh, as, as professionals that are governed by the acts. So if everybody keeps essentially their uh, hands in their own sandbox, it works really smoothly. There is no coercion with the, with the patient-doctor relationship. And we are doing some very big things there. Uh, when it becomes available, I would love to uh, bring you up to speed uh, so our colleagues can benefit from it, can invest in something they understand, and can benefit from something they understand better than uh, other financial products. Um. <clears throat> So but back to implants, um, you talk about uh, things you're excited about is one unit dental implants. Uh, t- why, why does that have you excited and what does that mean? Because for way too long, we have been uh, exposing patients to flippers and other items and they don't like it. I understand my colleagues are all going to come out, the ones that are uh, that are going to pose the questions, oh, integration, we, we came up with the idea of putting these implants under the bone for six months and letting them heal, so osteointegration is complete. Yes, those times, uh, at those times in history, we were forced to do that because we didn't have a better system, we didn't have a better plan. But now there are ideas, other forms and shapes that are going to convenience the patients to get into, first impressions are everything. I don't care how good of an prosthodontist, oral surgeon, implantologist, one thinks they are, first impressions with patients are everything. If you spend more time on your temporaries, they'll love you for it. They'll make a lot of noise for it. They see their face for the first time. It's a big event for them. So uh, to uh, to make them wait for six months, have them run around the flipper where you have substantial pockets of bone, where you could be smarter and have not something that's round, that's rotating around an axis with every force you apply on it and is going to fail, you can be more creative creating different designs and forms where you lock into the bone, you get much more stability at the beginning, you can load it, you can temporize it. The, you, I'm sure you have interviewed people that are talking about same day teeth and stuff. Our times, it's a great time in dentistry. A lot of things are happening. If you look up Yomi, for example, with the FDA, they just got approval with a handheld robotic that's gonna assist you in placing implants. We can do it more accurately, we can do it guided, you know where our bone is, and then it comes back to the very thing, Extractions. If you do your extractions right, you can use a guide to place your implant anywhere you want, but you have to know your extraction technique because when you lose your buckle bone, things get a little bit tough. So I want to change that for patients. I want to be there where I can create a product that is strong, that cannot break, that cannot be uh, rotated uh, due to its structure. There can't be any rotational failure. There can't be any fatigue failure because there are no screws. There are no, there are no, uh, there are no uh, abutment abutment parts. So it creates a whole new advantage for patients and uh, uh, and uh, we have solutions for the angulation problem and uh, and they will also be revealed when the product is on the market. Um, earlier you said uh, that you do all on eights and all on fours. What do you think um, all on fours invented by uh, the, oral, the oral surgeon Paolo Malo out of uh, Lisbon, Portugal. Some people say uh, all on four uh, if you lose one implant, now you have none on three. Well, what do you think of the all on four um, versus you know six or eight? 
And you're going to have a lot of surgeons that are going to come out and say, oh, I've been doing all on four for countless years and it works fine. I don't, I'm not an all on four kind of guy. I'm all about AP spread, anterior posterior spread. Your best anterior posterior spread you're going to get from an all on eight or more. Uh, but if you place them properly in a, in a format, an all on eight is best posterior. And in the, the all on four, you're absolutely right. You lose one implant, uh, it's game over for a little while. You got to replace it and come up with a new plan. Uh, if you lose one with all on eight, fine. You lose two, fine. Uh, you have to take uh, you have to take those items into consideration. I don't think hygiene is the best. Um, if you know biophysics concept, you know that you always want to exert the force down the long axis of a tooth or uh, an implant to have the best force distribution. With an all on four, you simply don't. You're coming at an angle. You're putting stress on the screw at the screw abutment level. And uh, you're setting yourself up for failure. It might work for some oral surgeons in periodontists because they're so good at it and so accurate and they've done it so many times and they know how to change the angulation for the best uh, uh, distribution at, at that time in that, in that place. But there's no doubt in my mind that all on four is superior than all on, I mean, all on eight is superior than all on four. It's, uh, it wouldn't well, what I don't understand is th these guys, you know, they'll be charging $25,000 for an arch. And I'm like, Dude, for twenty five grand, you couldn't afford to put a spare tire in there somewhere. I mean, <laughs> and, and you know what? And Jan, my, my dental assistant has been with me since day one, thirty years. I graduated dental school thirty years ago this month, May eleven, in Kansas City. And some of my biggest implant regrets was when um, you know a family member called and says, "Can you go see my mom in the nursing home? She was your patient forever." And I placed two implants and a three in a bridge. Now she's in a nursing home. She's very, very sick. She's probably not going to live much longer. One of the implants fails. And I'm thinking, why the hell did I save an implant? Why didn't I do three implants and three individual crowns? And even if I wanted to connect the implants for whatever reason, if I, I it's almost like Jan and I, so many times we drove back to the office saying, we should just place an implant under every crown because you don't, you, when you're, when you're a young dentist and you're looking at this patient, you know, especially when you're 25 and just walk out of school, you don't realize this person could live to be 65, 75, 85, 95. I mean, I have I have a, a handful of patients that are over 100. And so treatment planning for life in implantology, it's nice to have some spare tires. <laughs> You're very correct. We are not in no position to determine how long a patient lives. By, uh, by, our, by our standards... The, uh, that's not our position. We have to tr recommend the best treatment plan. And we, but the reason you probably did that bridge is because a lot of times patients cannot afford three implants. So you throw that in there and say, you know, an alternative option for you is I do a two unit and I bridge it over uh, as long as it's on the same implants, not uh, natural teeth. And you save this substantial amount of money. Uh, it's still better than doing a long span bridge, uh, picking up a tooth behind it and a tooth on the other side. So you've done the right thing. Uh, it would have been better, ideally, to have three implants, but uh, still, with those two implants and a bridge, you've done a better treatment plan for the patient than a flipper or a bridge of any other kind. You know, uh, you, you just said something flippantly that might have flown over their head. You said, as long as the implant bridge isn't attached to a natural tooth. Go back and explain that why. She might have just heard okay. it and say, said, what? So, implants are not teeth. If, if the most important message I can reveal here, which I constantly do on social media, implants are not teeth. Implants don't work on the biomechanic features of teeth. Teeth have a periodontal ligament. And until in stem research or other uh, research, we can restore the periodontal ligament where there's a slight give, we, implants will never be teeth. So if you start putting a bridge on a natural tooth and an implant, one of them is dynamic and one of them is static. Uh, uh, you're going to have a horrible uh, teeter-totter force distribution. It's going to fail. It's going to cause one or the other to fail. Now you got these Europeans coming out, and they got all these cute teeth that look like uh, natural teeth, which is, in my opinion, you're not really telling the consumer the truth. Yeah, you can you can do a 3D animation, and you can mill it out to look exactly like the tooth you're extracting. But the minute that tooth goes into that socket, with whatever impact method you're putting it, is operating on a different whole set of different biomechanical and biophysical concepts uh, than a tooth. So you have to be very careful. Is rarely is it justified for you to put uh, somehow have a bridge involved with a tooth. 
Uh, if you want to maybe rest it on there or preserve bone by keeping the root and plugging up the root on top and having something rest on, but uh, you're asking for trouble if you're uh, if you're <laughs> if you're uh, loading a natural tooth with an implant. So I, uh, um, they're driving to work. So what what I do on these podcasts is uh, we do um, we always do a transcript. So when we post on Dental Town, we do a transcript because they they can't take notes. And then another thing I do with my guests, I um, retweet their last um, uh, tweet. Uh, you want me to retweet? Uh, he that way when they get to work, they can say, "Okay, who is this guy?" He's at Keanor Shaw, K I A N O R S H A W. Um, I'm going to repeat uh, his uh, register here for CEA Dental dot com extraction, and another one that's got a bunch of uh, horses. So. Uh, so if you get to work, just go to at Howard Peran, and then you, my last uh, two retweets were at Um You promised me an hour of your amazingly busy life, and we uh, uh, actually went over an hour. But I just have one final question. Uh, what would your commencement speech be to these 6,000 graduates walking out of school who they're scared, they got a lot of debt, and they all have the same complaint? Everyone I talk to says, well, they didn't teach me how to do, I didn't place one implant. I didn't do one Invisalign. I didn't do one snore guard. And, and one of the things, they're, they're just overwhelmed because they're getting bombarded with, well, you should learn ortho or sleep apnea or Invisalign or place implants or, or go, you know, they're just overwhelmed. So pretend, I know you're too young uh, at uh, age 36 to have a daughter graduate from dental school because you're not Catholic. Um, you know, only, <laughs> only, only, ca- only 36 year old Catholics would have a child coming out of dental school. Um, talk to that kid, give her, uh, give, give her a three, four minute. I mean, I know we're in overtime, but give her a rant, give her some father, son, father, daughter advice. Experience is everything. Um, I started, I came out of dental school. I thought it was, I knew everything and uh, I could do everything, but it started with one guy, Dr. Francis, which was actually very heavily involved in dental town. And he would come to the office and I bought the office. He agreed to, to associate with me for a long time. And he actually passed away. He was a very, very well-known person at dental town. And I would get on the site. And if I had questions, I would read what my colleagues were saying. Because experience is everything. You can spend millions of dollars learning the stuff yourself by making mistakes. Or you can spend five minutes asking a question to your colleague. There's a certain bond between us that I've never seen in any other uh, profession or in in other activity of mine. When you identify yourself as your dentist and your colleague knows what they've gone through, you're going through, they're willing to help. And they don't always ask for anything in return. Get on these websites. Uh, start associating with a doctor. Uh, they have, they do most of the time have your best interest uh, in mind. Uh, use that as a stepping stone to building your own dream practice and uh, and building a career and life for yourself. You're gonna make mistakes. The most successful people in this world are the ones that keep getting up. They keep getting beaten down and they keep getting up and they keep coming back and they keep coming back. So yeah, you mess up a root canal, that's not the end of the world. You don't have to start thinking, oh, they're going to sue me. I'm going to get these student loans. I'm going to lose my wife, my house, and the cars, and the kids. Pick up the phone. Call an endodontist. Call an oral surgeon. Say, hey, I'll take you out for, for, for golf for coffee next week. Do me a favor. Bail me out with this patient. There's always a solution, and the best solution will always come from your colleagues. That's my opinion. And, uh, uh, and uh, feel free to reach out to us. And I continue to learn. Dr. Hartfran is uh, quite humble today, but he himself, I wanted to ask him one question at the end of this. What has motivated him of, of decades and decades to do what he has done for our community to bring us together to his venues? Uh, I've always wondered that. But one solid, most important lesson, go to your colleagues, reach out for help, reach out for advice. Don't pay the money to learn it the hard way. Learn it from other people's experience, and then make your own opinion about how it should be done. Uh, I, I just, I just, you know, I think part of it. Well, you know, it's a long story, but I, I think part of it is uh, um, my dad was always humble, hungry, and curious. And 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 if you're humble, you listen to your colleagues, you listen to your staff, you listen to your patients. Uh, if you're hungry and have a work ethic, I mean, if, if you're always, uh, and Patton said in war, if you're always moving. You're going to win the war. Just don't stop, trench, dig in. Just keep moving. Um, and intellectual curiosity. I would say in my 30 years watching General Dennis, 
the ones that were humble, hungry, and took at least 100 hours of CE a year. You know, like you got all these initials after your name. Everybody I know, they got their FAGD, their MAGD, their diplomat and anything it, that's tagging their behavior, that they're, they're curious. And half of those courses I went to, I learned more from meeting friends at the break who became friends than I did from the lecture. I mean, I, 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 I like, like yep. I, me- I remember going to the Mission Institute. I mean, I made so many lifelong friends and, and, you know, Carl's lecturing there, but it's later, a week later, you're calling your buddy at the course saying, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And so just, just stay humble and curious of all these websites. Uh, where should my, uh, which one should my homies go to? Kyanor, K-I-A-N-O-R-S-H-A-W, and I just retweeted two tweets, so you'll find them there. How can they contact you? And there's a contact on that site, or they can uh, email me. One uh, one thing, I have, uh, I'm, uh, I will respond, especially to my colleagues. If you're a dentist and you're reaching out to me, there's always an open door and open uh, uh, line here. So what's your email? K-I-A-N-O-R dot S-H-A-H at gmail.com. Hey, man, I'm a, a big fan of you. Uh, I love reading your post on um, um, LinkedIn. Uh, I, we, we, when you write those big LinkedIn deals, um, you should repost them on uh, a blog on downtown or start a thread because one thing that's really, really cool, I, tell, I was telling everybody that, uh, you know, these people in dentistry, they, they write these columns for free. I mean, we, we've never paid anybody to write an article for Dentaltown. And when you read that on, in a magazine – no one knows you read it or anything, but on Dentaltown, when you read that magazine, there's a share button. So if you read a, an, a, an article or a blog and you think, well, that, that was really cool. Thanks for writing that for free and sharing it with me. Then just reach up there and click share on Facebook, share on Twitter, share on LinkedIn. And, the, and I want to thank my homies so much for this because the shares, if you look at the shares of all the blogs and, um, and magazine articles online, I mean, it just, it just keeps going and going and going. And every time I'm on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, I see all these blogs and articles that someone posted on Dentaltown. And it is, you know, I always tell my patients, the greatest gift a patient can give me is a referral, a friend, or loved one. And the greatest gift you can give any of your dental colleagues who are taking the uh, – a lot of time to write these blogs, articles for Dentaltown Magazine. If you liked it, but you don't want to comment, or maybe you're anonymous, um, just 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 hit share. Just share it to your, your colleagues. And and I think, um, my God, the, the number of shares from our blogs and Dentaltown Magazine articles is literally doubling like every four months. And, and that is uh, so much respect. So a big shout out, respect to all my homies out there. Um, because like when you wrote that last article, I just read it in your LinkedIn. I mean, seriously, how long did it take you to write that article? Um, it takes quite a while, but where I've been mostly involved with you is on Facebook and LinkedIn because you're active everywhere. And I got to tell you on behalf of all of my colleagues, I would like to thank you for what you do for us. Um, uh, cause nobody else is doing what you're doing. Um, and also I've been sharing a lot of your stuff, especially the humor. It makes people's day when you post <laughs> these humor things. <laughs> And I repost them and everybody enjoys those. But uh, I will get with Ryan and a couple of other doctors that you took interest in. And uh, I will set everything up so we can uh, collaborate. You certainly have another lifelong friend here. Oh, thank you, buddy. And uh, by the way, uh, you you must be the youngest person in Palm Springs. Whenever I go there, the 80-year-old <laughs> is the hot chick at the at the pool. I mean, uh, you're, you're, you're in a town where, uh, I mean, how many people live in Palm Springs that are over 100? Uh, a lot, but when you're in the implant and full mod rehab business, then uh, it's a very good environment to be in. Okay, well, hey, if you ever drive through Phoenix, stop by the house and uh, we'll have a beer, go to a restaurant, have dinner, or whatever. Let me know. And any of your colleagues that you want to do a podcast or put online CE or write an article, just let me know. Yeah, I think you're doing a podcast with John Stefano from the Treatment Plan Academy soon. I think that's going to be exciting. And he's coming to visit you. Maybe I'll tag along. Okay. All Thank right, you, buddy. sir. Thank you for an hour of your life. Thank you so much.